Some people have confused it and think that abundance means wanting and getting. <laughs> abundance, if you think abundantly, you'll get all the money you want. You know, you'll get a big house, you'll get a new fancy car, you'll get the splendid partner that you deserve on this earth or whatever. Do you know what I mean? That that's supposed to be called... <laughs> yeah, right. You do know, huh? That's supposed to be called abundance. You know what that is? That's greed. That's wanting. That's not abundance at all. And then you go out and you test it to see if you've tuned to the right state. You go and see if you can create a parking space just where you want it, you know? It's, right? That's not true abundance. Because it's connected with things and trying to get or possess things. True abundance and true generosity is a thing of the spirit. It has nothing to do with the outer things at all. Hello and welcome back to Heart Wisdom, the flowing spring of Jack Cornfield Dharma Talks brand new and vintage here on the Be Here Now Network. I'm Ganesh, honored to be taking in this refreshing, cool dharma with you all. This episode, number 240, is all about abundance. And abundance seems to be a hot topic nowadays. It's thrown down in the hashtags quite a bit. And it feels like something that many people in the spiritual community keep coming back to. And I always thought I knew what it was. I thought it was about things, having enough things, having enough money in the bank. I was actually on a call with a friend and consultant and I kept using the word abundance. And she kept saying, what, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? And I didn't understand that I had been using it incorrectly. Jack, in this episode, as he lays out the blueprint for unlocking true abundance, shares that abundance is about non-greed. It's about generosity, simplicity, and harmony. And through this lens, he actually shares how we can alchemize our desires, our endless wantings, into a beneficial awakened dance with the world. But before we get to that dance and Jack sharing about creating his own bodhisattva vows in the Rocky Mountains when he was teaching at Naropa, we do have a tiny bit of housekeeping. This June starts a live cohort for Jack Cornfield's Learn the Dynamic Art of Guided Meditation this is a online course that you can dive into at any time, but if you sign up before June 6th, you can take part in the live question and answer sessions with Jack, where you can join online and ask questions about the course topics or anything in your life that you feel you would like to bring up and dive into with Jack. Then on June 4th, Jack is part of a free summit, the Power of Love Summit. He will be presenting with Trudy on relationships. And then June 22nd, Jack will be back at Spirit Rock. He will be teaching a day long called The Awakened Heart, Mindfulness and Compassion Practices for Living a Wise and Free Life. And if you can't make it on site at Spirit Rock as the spaces are limited, you can join online for this amazing day-long retreat. You can find all of these at jackcornfield.com, along with a lot of other great courses, Dharma talks, guided meditations, articles, and more. So there we go. I am noticing the abundance that I live within to be able to spend these moments with you all here each week. So thank you for your divine attention. And as we all sit here and sip from this cool Dharma spring, 
I wish that you may be happy, that you may be healthy, that you may help others through the authenticity of your being, and that your heart be smiling. Namaste. The last four weeks or so, I've been speaking about the fundamentals of Buddhist psychology. I started by explaining that in the traditional Buddhist psychology, our whole world of experience is seen as the six senses of sight and sound and smell and taste and bodily feelings, perceptions, and then mental ones, thoughts and images and emotions. And that those six senses, counting the heart or mind as the sixth, are received by a function known as consciousness, which receives the sense impressions. And then between the senses and consciousness arise all kinds of states or strategies or relations which determine whether we live skillfully or unskillfully, happily or miserably. The senses keep changing, pleasant and unpleasant, all the time. But how we relate to them in our life creates our sorrows or our, our freedom. And I talked about for three weeks, the, the three root unskillful strategies of grasping and greed, of aversion and judgment, pushing things away, and of denial and delusion, not opening to what is. And then last week, I started on the opposite strategies, non-delusion, spaciousness, or clarity, presence. Does my speaking of these things, for those who came last week or the week before, does this connect with your meditation practice or with your week as it follows from that? Just to know. Yeah. Does it remind you in some way of something? Or does it help you look at things? Yeah. That's its intention anyway. All right, then later on I'll ask you what you learned. But we'll, <laughs> and you'll get graded, obviously. Now tonight, as last week, we talked about non-delusion or spaciousness, clarity of heart and mind. Tonight, I'd like to talk about the opposite of greed or grasping or wanting, which is called non-greed in the Buddhist psychology. It's the strategy of not holding or letting go. It's also called dana, which is the word for generosity or service or uh, an open-hearted relationship to things or a deep caring for all that arises in our experience. This is dana. Now, greed, if you remember again, maybe not the right word, is the strategy of when you experience things in, in life, it's the strategy that says, I like this and I like that and I want more of that and more of this, that walks into the room and sees what it wants and tries to get it and hold it and keep it. It's the strategy of if only, if I could get this, and then I could get that, and this, and this, and kind of enlarge my territory, then I'd be fine and happy and fulfilled and safe. In a sense, it's a strategy of impoverishment, of feeling like we're not enough, but if we eat enough and see enough and have sexual intercourse with enough and buy enough, etc., then maybe that inner poverty will be alleviated. It's a sense of impoverishment or rejection or some hole in ourselves, some hunger, hunger of body or spirit or heart that we try to fill up. And you can feel it in our times. There is this very deep sorrow in our culture, in every magazine and in almost every television advertisement, how lost we are in this culture and how it's put out that if you get more of this, it will fill up that sorrow, that place. One wonders at times whether the revolutions in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, in some way they're the revolutions of people wanting freedom, but as someone said, is it also not perhaps a VCR revolution that people really want, you know, video, home videos, and then they'd be happy? We hope not. Now, the opposite strategy of endless wanting, which, I mean, wanting is okay. It's the endless part that gets troublesome. You know what I mean? <laughs> the opposite strategy of endless wanting 
is to transform that very energy into an awakened capacity, the capacity of a bodhisattva or a Buddha of a hundred thousand skillful means. It means to take that desire and love and interest in form and things and the world around and use it instead, amplify it, appreciate its sensitivity and use it for finding beauty and expressing harmony and playing with the world and expressing a vision of what's true. Use it to learn to dance or to live in the Tao, to let our being in some harmonious way express the Dharma or teach the truth or the law or the way in our life. It's to take that very interest in the world and turn it around into something that follows the Tao or the law. The meaning of bodhisattva, a being who's committed to awakening or liberation, is a being who uses whatever is at hand to express compassion, whatever vehicles are present to awaken, to bring liberation. It said, even if the sun should arise in the West, even if the sun, the whole world is turned upside down, the bodhisattva has only one way, which is meeting that too with a generosity of spirit and a creativity to say, let's turn this into the Dharma as well. Even our greed and our loneliness and our longing and our wanting, the if only, even that, in that, is the longing for something deeper, something more genuine. What is that that we really long for in ourselves? If you take a second to listen, this is really what meditation is about, is listening. What is it that we truly want? in this life, in this body, in this time. Now there's a confusion in modern kind of contemporary spirituality in regards to abundance and wanting. They've gotten somehow mixed up in the so-called new age, which is neither. Neither new nor an age, perhaps. <laughs> Some people have confused it and think that abundance means wanting and getting. Abundance, if you think abundantly, you'll get all the money you want. You know, you'll get a big house, you'll get a new fancy car, you'll get the splendid partner that you deserve on this earth or whatever. Do you know what I mean? that that's supposed to be called... <laughs> yeah, right. You do know, huh? That's supposed to be called abundance. You know what that is? That's greed. That's wanting. That's not abundance at all. And then you go out and you test it to see if you've tuned to the right state. You go and see if you can create a parking space just where you want it, you know? It's, right? That's not true abundance <laughs> because it's connected with things and trying to get or possess things. True abundance and true generosity is a thing of the spirit. It has nothing to do with the outer things at all. So it's not to be confused with wanting. Abundance, again, non-greed, this capacity of dana is also not weak or to be confused with just things that are beautiful with crystals and love and light and and uh you know the age of aquarius or whatever it happens to be that's not abundance either that's kind of being naive or starry-eyed in some way it's a nice story. I mean, as the Grimm's brothers go, it's one of the more light stories, but it's, a, it's an okay story. But it's not abundance. <laughs> to experience true abundance, we must also touch the capacity 
to face the dark, to face the shadow of life, to face death, to look at the end of things since everything ends, to look at that, to face loss and change and selfishness and fear and know it for what it is. It's like Suzuki Roshi dying and saying, if when I die, if I suffer, that's all right, you know, that's just suffering, Buddha. That's a kind of abundance. I can suffer and that's all right. It's the capacity to face injustice and to respond to it. That's a kind of abundance that we will, we will see the injustice and have that capacity to face it and to respond. As Martin Luther King did again in almost the same phrase as Suzuki Roshi. He said, we will soon wear you down with our capacity to suffer. We're so unafraid of the dark and the suffering that we will triumph because of that abundance of spirit. That's a kind of inner abundance. And it's our capacity to face the music, to call a spade a spade, a rat a rat, a turkey a turkey, right? (laughs) A monkey a monkey, would you believe? We used to call the Defense Department the War Department. I like that much better. Before Newspeak took over, and our missiles were named peacekeeping missiles and (laughs) things like that. There's a kind of abundance of spirit that faces even Stalin or Hitler or the starvation in the world and says, I see it, and I will respond to this. I have this capacity. Do you understand that abundance is a very deep thing? Abundance of spirit. So it's not to be confused with wanting. Wanting a car or long life or a great partner or a hot tub or a parking space. That's not abundance. Nor is it to be confused with fear or light, just everything beautiful. Not the fear of change or of death or of the darkness. It's really an abundance of the heart. There's an African proverb that says, it's the heart that lets go, the fingers merely follow. In our actions, it comes from within us. My colleague in teaching and friend, uh, Joseph Goldstein, practiced for a lot of years in India, much of the time while I was in Thailand and Burmese monasteries. Mm -hmm. And at some point during his years of practice in Asia, he got his mother to come over and visit and stay with him in this village, Bodh Gaya, where the Buddha was enlightened in the province of Bihar in northern India. It's a very poor area of India. And this village has a lot of different Buddhist temples in it. Mostly you walk around. There's a small marketplace and so forth. And she went to visit him in the early 70s. Never had been to a place like India. Nobody ever has, for that matter, until you go to India. There's nothing quite like it. And she was used, as you can imagine, most 60-year-old Americans who grew up and lived in New York, upstate New York, whatever. She was used to our kind of culture and our uh, the, the cleanliness of the food, the ease of transportation, the, the fine medical facilities, etc., that most of us experience in a big house. And she arrived, and he got a good room for her in one of the temples in Bodh Gaya, which meant first that she had her own room, that the roof did not leak, that she had a bed on it. It was just a single, very simple bed with a mattress probably that thick, which is a good Indian mattress, right? She didn't have to sleep on the floor. And it was a concrete room, concrete block, which is very fancy in India. It wasn't made of mud. Ten by ten. A chair and a small table. And she talked about spending time in that room. She stayed for a month and visited his teacher, and he showed her all around the temples and took her around. After coming from a house full of things, you know, our kitchens and dining rooms and living rooms and furniture and appliances, cars, living incredibly simply. And at first it frightened her, as you can imagine. How will I do this month? But by the end of one month there, She talked about how it was one of the happiest, if not the happiest time in her life. She lived incredibly simply. She had nothing. 
almost, and nothing to take care of. And what a joy that was. Abundance of the Spirit doesn't mean things, but it means discovering a kind of simplicity of our life where we're abundant in any circumstance. We've talked in here in different nights about the world and what it needs, its sorrows, and it doesn't need more oil or more food or more energy or more buildings or books. It needs less greed and less prejudice and less fear, the things that cause wars and keep the food here and the starving people over there. We don't need more except perhaps more love. As we pay attention in meditation or in our spiritual life as we live each day, it's possible to discover this capacity of non-greed, of dana, of generosity, of abundance. And it's born out of our sense of interconnectedness. It used to be that a chief function of a healthy family life, of, of a healthy relationship to one's mother and father, one's parents, was to give a child through enough holding and nurturance the sense of this abundance that the world could provide. Unfortunately, in modern technological complex societies, most of us don't get that. Lots of us weren't fathered. Many of us weren't mothered or haven't had the chance to father and mother as we would like. Not a small thing, really. So then it falls on your spiritual practice, your guru, perhaps. That might be your teacher's function to bring you again to that state of abundance, or at least to point to it. Here's Krishnamurti as kind of, he likes to play the role of the stern father. Consciously or unconsciously, we are all utterly selfish, he says. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> and so long as we get what we want, we consider everything all right. But the moment an event takes place to shatter all this, we cry out in despair, hoping to find other comforts, which, of course, will again later be shattered. So the process goes on and on, and if you want to be caught in it, knowing full well the implications of it, then go right ahead. But if you can stop and see the true absurdity of that whole process, then you will naturally also stop crying and begin to live with a smile on your lips. So we used to get it from our parents, and maybe now we seek it from spiritual life or from meditation itself, some way to discover or rediscover or connect with an inner sense of wholeness or well-being or completeness. To discover this in our heart is called awakening the bodhisattva in us, awakening to our Buddha nature. And the first vow of uh, the Bodhisattva vows, is sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them all. That's a pretty audacious statement, don't you think? There are a lot of beetles and monkeys and jaguars and whales and so forth. You're going to save all beings. Me. Now, does it mean that, you know, here, I, Jack Cornfield, I'm going to go out and save all these beings? Obviously, that's not the level that it speaks to. What it really speaks to is moving from a small or impoverished sense of ourself, from this small me, to see in some way that we're all in it together, to experience that, so that as I love, we love. As I learn to be generous, we all share in that generosity. When I was 30 years old, turned my 30th birthday, I'd been teaching the uh, summer of Naropa Institute in 1975, the second summer, done a whole series of classes, and then went up to do a retreat in the mountains in between the semesters there. I was in this room alone just meditating, and I'd been teaching for several years back in America, 
And I decided I'm going to take the, the formal bodhisattva vows for my 30th birthday. It'll be a great thing to do. So I sat and I walked and I got very, very still. And by the end of the week of sitting in the mountains, it came time to read these vows. And it said, sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them all. And the dharmas are endless. I vow to master them all and so forth. There are four vows. And I picked them up to read them. And I was very still after a week at 12,000 feet in the, in the uh, Rockies, meditating intensively. And I read them, and they made no sense to me at all. None. <laughs> Because my thinking had stopped for that time. My mind was really silent. And I looked at this, and it said sentient beings. And I said, now, what's a sentient being? It was just a concept. And I was, you mean those other people? But they're not other. They're only other in when you create the sense of yourself. But when the thought stopped and the, the really deep silence that comes on us at those special moments, walking in the forest or being with another person in a certain way, wherever it is, it doesn't even make sense. I'm going to do something for you. And so I rewrote them all. I changed them. <laughs> Speak, speaking of audacious. And some night I'll tell how I rewrote them. I won't do that too much. But it's good, actually. So it's discovering for the bodhisattva, sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them all. It's not me, this small me, but that we will do this together, that we will awaken this spirit together. Yeats discovered it. And there's a beautiful poem I heard read this weekend from, from Robert Bly, where, as best as I can remember the poem, Yeats was now 50 years old, and he was sitting in a tea shop, his teacup was empty and the table, the marble table was there. And he was just sitting with the bare facts of being a, a man or a woman, a human being on this earth. And he discovered, or it came to him unbidden, something secret and complete and golden, he describes in this poem. And the last lines go something like, for 20 minutes, more or less, this happened. And he discovered that all that mattered is to be blessed and to bless. For 20 minutes, more or less, all that matters is to be blessed and to bless. And that was, after 50 years, that was really the culmination of his understanding or his insight. To awaken in us a sense of being the vehicle or the container for this abundance through which abundance can be expressed. We're born of this earth. We come from, go out there and feel the dirt. That's what this is made of, minerals, right? You eat food that grew out of that. We're born of Mother Earth. The earth body, the rain body, your mother's body, literally, the sunlight body, that's what gives you this body. This is called, in Sanskrit, the food body. And you know where the food comes from. This is your food body. Gee, you thought it was yours. It's actually all those waffles you ate as a child. <laughs> you know, that's what it is. We eat of the earth, and then as we move and breathe and interact, we give back, we give off, we expire. Our breath comes out, our words come out, our movement. We're in this process of receiving and letting go every moment that we breathe, every time that we eat. It's taking of the earth and putting of the earth into earth. Or as it's said in the Hindu tradition, it's God putting God into God. It's all the same. This is why we speak of Buddha nature in meditation or the sense of royalty that when you sit, you can find after some time in your meditation this sense of being like a queen or a king that sits with an openness of heart and spirit, a sense of real abundance that can face anything, the sorrows and the dark and injustice and respond and the beauty and the light, to sit in a certain, in, in the seat in the center of it all. And from that place, then you give of your joy, you give things, you give attention, you give time, not because you have to give it, but because it moves through you. 
I teach sometimes up at the uh, kindergarten where my daughter goes to school. In fact, this week I'm going to go in and teach the five-year-old's meditation of some kind or other. Close your eyes and imagine you're a balloon floating in the sky or something like that. And I notice in the class that there are especially a, a group of a few boys that come when I go there and it's probably true for the other men that go teach there because there's a woman teacher as the key teacher who just hang around me. They'll grab onto my leg or they'll follow me around or they'll want to show me things. Um, And it's like they're so hungry just to have some other man there that they can relate to. And the sense of abundance is simply to be there for another person because 50% of the children in our culture don't live with their fathers. And that really affects things a lot. So to sense in ourselves this capacity of abundance. We all have, without exception, a very deep longing to give. To give to the earth, to give to others, to give to the society to work, to love, to care for this earth. That's true for every every human being. And even the ones who don't find it, it's because it's been squashed or somehow suppressed in some brutal way in their life. But it's there to be discovered. We all long for that. And there's a tremendous sorrow for a human being who doesn't find a way to give. One of the worst of human sufferings is not to find a way to love or a place to work and give of your heart and your being. How can we do this in our life? This is really what mindfulness is about. Wakefulness, attention, this meditation. You start very simply. You start right here where you are, in this moment, in this body, in each situation. As Rumi says, the Persian poet, you say you can't create anything original? Don't worry about it. Create a cup from which your brother or sister can drink. You say you can't create anything original? Where should I start? I don't know what to do. Don't worry about it. Create a cup from which your brother or sister can drink. Very simple things. To be there for a child or a friend. The Buddha talked about dana very often. He said it was one of the grounds of living the holy life or the spiritual life is this capacity to give. And he said that we can cultivate it, develop it, nourish it, practice it, risk with it until we learn it. He said there were three levels of happiness in this dana, in this giving generosity. The first is called tentative giving, which is already a certain happiness. Well, should I? Shouldn't I? Well, I might use this some other time. Maybe I better put it in the attic. No, it'll take up too much space. Here, I'll give it to the people who might need it more. Sort of that, you know, that little tentative giving. Or should I say, yes, they need the help, but I might be a little tired afterward. It's sort of that back and forth. And then you do it, and it's wonderful. It brings a certain happiness. Then the second level is called brotherly or sisterly giving, friendly giving. It's where you say, I have this, share in this too. And you give to others of your time, your love, your energy, your money, your whatever it happens to be because you sense them as your sisters and brothers. And there's this joy in sharing what you have. Not because you're supposed to, but just because you're connected. And it brings even more happiness than the tentative giving. And then finally, there's the level that's called kingly or queenly giving, where you give of the best you have. This is the most beautiful thing I have. Won't you please enjoy it? And the delight of giving is so great that it doesn't matter what you have. You want to give it away to some extent. I don't mean being foolish about it or pretending you're somewhere that you're not. 
But that's why this is called a cultivation or a mm-hmm. nourishment or a practice. We can play with this. You can work with it. One of the practices I've done in my own life now for 10 years is whenever a thought arises that I should give something to someone, money or help or whatever, I do it. And there have been a few times when I haven't with extenuating circumstances, but in the last 10 years, for the most part, I've just done it. I said, if that arises, I'm going to do it. And what you discover, then all those other voices come saying, you can't, it's too expensive, you don't have this and all those reasons why not. Thank you for your opinion. Then you go ahead and you do it. It's, we have within us the capacity to open and to shape our hearts or to allow our hearts to be a very different way than what our culture teaches us about. We actually have so many things to give. Simple ones that are important. Obviously giving of our love. The generosity of space. Giving of silence. What a gift to give people. The silence of listening rather than imposing. Daily sitting helps a lot with that, if you have trouble with that. Taking the time to give to yourself some period of silence. So that then when you're with others, you're not quite so full. And you can say, yes, what is it that you have to say? And really listen. To give of our attention, our listening, our silence is a wonderful gift. What other simple things can you give? (coughs) You can give a smile. It's actually a rather major gift at times. It is. It's a very significant gift. And there are times when, I'm not going to give you that. I'll give you anything but that. I won't give you a smile. (laughs) You know those moments? Can be a really major gift. We can give our vision. We can give our commitment, our strength, our caring for justice. Not small things our willingness to stand up for what we believe. We can give our simple honesty. I'm tired. I'm burned out. This is my limit. How about you? Are you okay? That's a great thing to give, just to give your honesty. Say, this is where I am. This is all I can give today. Ah, Everybody else says, thank God, I'm tired too. And then we give each other that. There's so many things that we can give. And they come not because you have to plan it so much, but out of this sense of being whole in yourself, being connected with yourself and the world. Give our silence, our listening, our vision, our smiles, our integrity. We can give our blessings. Robert Bly talked about that this weekend in a beautiful way. And on television in his Moyers interview, he asked in one of his groups, talking to the men that he was meeting with, he said to this whole group of men, all right, all of you out of these many hundred who are older men, more than 50 years old, could ask it of the old women as well. How many of you have admired or complimented or blessed some younger man or some younger woman this, this day, today? Almost nobody raised their hand. How about this week? Almost no one raised their hand. This month? This year? We can bless other people, and it's a wonderful thing to do. To bless means simply to admire or to honor or to compliment in some way, to see that which is beautiful in another person and let them know. That's a very regal, bodhisattva, queenly, kingly thing to do. It doesn't cost much, and it's fantastic. Our culture could use a lot more of it. <laughs> Ramdas's teacher, Neem Karoli Baba, Maharaji, Ramdas would go to him and say, well, how should I do my spiritual practice? Love people. Well, what should I do? Should I meditate? Should I do yoga? Feed people. That was all he said, love people and feed them. It's a path, it's a path to practice, to give. 
and it grows as you practice. It's wonderful. It's also an expression of our heart, of, of our awakening, that as we awaken, it happens. It just does itself. And in the end, if you pay attention and you listen to what it means to give, and the people that I know that are philanthropists, both with great deals of money or a great deal of time and energy they give, they love doing it. They do it not, you know, I'm giving you this money and there's kind of a grudge about it, but this is fantastic that I'm able to help. If we listen inside and pay attention to what this whole process of abundance and generosity is about, service, we discover that we never do it for someone else. You don't do it for anybody else. I mean, in the beginning, you might do it to be loved back or for some money that you're going to get because you're good in some other way or some attention or something. But as you play with it and it opens in you, we all have that, you find that you're always doing it for only one person, for yourself. And you talk to people who do hospice work and they clean out the mouth of people who are dying of AIDS or there with cancer patients. And why do you do that? Are you giving this to someone? It was an honor to be with this person when they died. I felt so touched by that, so moved by the genuineness of that moment. People ask Gandhi why he did it. He said he was doing it for himself. If Gandhi could do it for himself, he did a lot for himself, obviously. It's a privilege to give. It's a privilege to express our hearts. And we all have that privilege. This is what it means to awaken the spirit of non-greed, of non-possessiveness. Now I want to end by reading two things, if I may. Or even if I may not. doesn't matter. One is the last few paragraphs from the story of Nuno Cabeza de Vaca, which some of you may know and Others, if you don't, you can buy at least see some part of it in the book that Christina Feldman and I have just finished. It will be an anthology of stories called Stories of the Spirit, Stories of the Heart. But anyway, Nuno Cabeza de Vaca was a real man who was a Spanish explorer. Arrived in Florida in 1580 or something like that along with 500 other conquistadors and their horses and armor, got off and ended up in the swamps of Florida. And to keep the story very short, within a short period of time, all but four of them died through a series of calamities. And the story of Nuno is the letter that he wrote back to the king of Spain. After those, everyone died and the Indians killed some in the swamps and the alligators and the surf and so forth, those four started to wander and they were taken over by this group of very impoverished Indians who said, we'll feed you, even though we have very little food and keep you alive, if you become our healers. And they started bringing them sick people. And I mean, we're talking serious sickness. And they said, what could we do? I mean, this is life or death. Either we heal these people or, or we're done for. And they sat there, not very religious men, as you can imagine conquistadors to be, Right. Or maybe they did it for the church, who knows, but that's another story we won't tell tonight. And they prayed. They prayed their rear ends off, basically. (laughs) And at some point, what came to them in that hour of need and prayer was the capacity to heal. And they started to heal people. And the Indians moved with them, and they met other tribes. And the story is a saga of eight years of walking with the Indians on foot from Florida back down to Mexico City, from one tribe to another as healers. And as each year goes by and they starve a bit more and they have more difficulty, they lose more and more of the Spaniard and they walk barefoot and they become the Indians that they're healing. This is a true story. And then all of a sudden they're back in Mexico City or near there And they see the first Spaniards coming off the boats with their armors and spears to capture Indians to make them slaves. And they see themselves as they were eight years before with different eyes. It's quite an extraordinary story. 
Your majesty will remember my indignation in that first narrative that Christians should be so wicked because the first ones that they ran into tried to take the Indians that they were with and make them into slaves. And facing these marauders, I was compelled to face the Spanish gentleman I myself had been eight years before. It was not easy to think of. What, your majesty, writing to the king, is so melancholy as to confront one's former unthinking and unfeeling self? It was many days before I could endure the touch of clothing, many a night before I could bear to sleep in a bed after years under the stars. Shoes were the worst, and he goes on, talking about the process of being re-civilized. At first, I did not notice the other ways in which our ancient civilization was affecting me. After years of giving everything I had, I soon observed again a reluctance in me to do good for others. I would say to myself, need I exert what is left of me? I who've undergone tortures in an open boat and every privation and humiliation among the Indians, when there are now strong, healthy men about me, fresh from the holy church and the motherland from school who know their Christian duty. We Europeans all talk this way to ourselves, don't we, your majesty? It has become second nature to us if we are honest. We can admit it privately, can we not, your majesty? If a man needs a cloak, we don't give it to him if we have our wits about us, nor are we caught stretching out our finger in the aid of some miserable woman. Someone else will do it, we say. Our communal life dries up in our milk. Drives, dries up our milk. We are barren as the fields of Castile. We regard our native land as a power which should act of itself, and this relieves each of us of our exertion. While with them, I thought only about doing the Indians good. But back among my fellow countrymen, I had to be on my guard not to do them positive harm. If... If one lives where all suffer and starve, one acts on one's own impulse to help. But where plenty abounds, we surrender our generosity, believing that our country replaces us each and several. This is not so, and indeed a great delusion, your majesty. On the contrary, the power of maintaining life in others lives within each of us, and from each of us does it recede when unused. It is a concentrated power and a great one. If you are not acquainted with it, your majesty can have no inkling of what it is like and what it portends or the ways in which it slips from one if one does not understand. Quite a powerful passage, isn't it? I said I'd read you two things to end. The other is very brief it's from an article about Supreme Court Justice William Brennan, 30 years on the Supreme Court, and a man for whom justice, in the most genuine sense, and caring in his decisions for the rights of everyone in the society, his dream is that as he says, no one, eventually no one anywhere will be not denied his or her inherent dignity and rights. And for 30 years, the decisions I have made have been to support the dignity and rights of every member of our society. And he says he's particularly moved for these 30 years by a line in a play by Yeats also about a poor old woman, which he said, the line goes like this, someone says, did you see an old woman going down the path, asked Bridget in the play? I did not, replies Patrick, who came into the house just after the old woman had left. But I saw a young girl, and she had the walk of a queen. Brennan smiled. That passage has always meant a great deal to me. I've used it in my work over and over for the last 30 years. Can you hear the abundance in that? Did you see an old woman just leave this house? I did not. But I saw a young girl and she had the walk of a queen.
to sit, to meditate, to awaken in our spiritual life, in all of the actions of our world, is to discover the power of this non-greed, of dana, of generosity, of abundance, and to bring it alive again on the earth. <laughs>